Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and today we will talk about molar pregnancy, choriocarcinoma and chorion epithelioma. A molar pregnancy is the result of a faulty fertilization of an oocyte, resulting first in the formation of an irregular zygote and then in the irregular formation of the placenta without a viable fetus. It occurs in around 1 out of 1,000 fertilizations and is characterized by the excessive proliferation of the trophoblastic cells. We can divide the molar pregnancy into two main types, the complete molar pregnancy and the incomplete molar pregnancy. In a complete molar pregnancy, there is a genetically empty ovum which is fertilized by one spermatocyte. As the cell aims to form a normal 46 chromosome zygote, the genetic information of the spermatocyte is duplicated, but a zygote only contains genetic information from the father, so no fetus forms. However, the spermatocyte carries the information for the formation of the placenta. So an abnormal placenta forms and eventually fills the uterus. In rare cases, the genetically empty oocyte is fertilized by two different spermatocytes, so no duplication is necessary. However, also in this case, no fetal tissue develops. In an incomplete molar pregnancy, a genetically normal oocyte is fertilized by two spermatocytes simultaneously, leading to the formation of a zygote with 69 chromosomes, so 23 from the oocyte, 23 from the first spermatocyte, and another 23 from the second spermatocyte. A fetus starts to develop as maternal and paternal genetic material is present, but it is not able to survive. This usually leads to a miscarriage. Both types of molar pregnancies can develop into an invasive molar pregnancy. This occurs when the growth of the mole is not restricted to the endometrium and the uterine cavity, but grows into the myometrium, where it gains access to the blood circulation and lymphatic vessels. By this invasion, cells of the molar pregnancy are shed into the circulation where they are transported to distant organs and continue their growth there. A molar pregnancy could theoretically develop in any event of fertilization, but there are a few risk factors increasing its chance. Those are having had a prior molar pregnancy or a history of miscarriage, having family members that experienced a molar pregnancy or a pregnancy occurring in patients 15 years and younger or 35 years and older. In the next point, I want to talk about the clinical features of a molar pregnancy. Generally, the symptoms are more severe in a complete mole. They include vaginal bleeding during the first trimester that may or may not include the passage of grape-like formations of molar tissue, an enlarged uterus, pelvic pressure, endocrine symptoms due to increased levels of beta-HCG, preeclampsia, hyperemesis gravidarum, and the formation of ovarian theca lutein cysts, which are often bilateral and tender to touch. In an incomplete mole, the symptoms are usually limited to pelvic tenderness and slight vaginal bleeding. So, how can we diagnose a molar pregnancy? Initially, the diagnosis of choice is to do a laboratory test, which includes the levels of beta-HCG. The HCG levels are usually markedly increased, much higher than usually to be expected for the respective gestational age. This is due to the fact that HCG is produced by the placenta. 
and in case of a mother pregnancy, we practically have a placenta that eventually occupies the entire space of the uterine cavity. Also, we expect that the HCG levels are higher in a complete mole in comparison to an incomplete mole. Another test that we can do is a transvaginal ultrasound. Here we can see the molar formation inside the uterus in the form of an echogenic mass, which is diffusely interrupted by hypoechoic cystic spaces. It resembles a bunch of grapes, Swiss cheese, or a snowstorm. In a complete mole, we also recognize the absence of amniotic fluid, fetal parts, or a fetal heart tone. In an incomplete mole, we will be able to see fetal parts, as well as a heart rate and some amniotic fluid. I also want to mention the P57 gene, also called KIP2 gene. It is strongly paternally imprinted and only expressed from the maternal allele. Because in a complete mole there is no maternal genetic information, the P57 gene won't be expressed. We can use a special P57 immunostaining to differentiate between an incomplete and a complete mole. In the next point I want to talk about a the therapy of this condition. In both forms we have to completely remove the growing material from the uterus. Here we usually use a dilation and suction curatage. The removal of the tissue can be supported by giving prostaglandins. After the curatage, a manual exploration of the uterus has to be done carefully to ensure that all material has been removed. Usually oxytocin is then administered to increase the tone of the uterus and so to decrease the total blood loss. In some cases, antibiotics can be given prophylactically to prevent an inflammation of the endometrium. In severe cases, a hysterectomy can be done as a last resort if the bleeding cannot be stopped. In case of an invasive mole, a chemotherapy is usually done. In low-risk cases, methotrexate and folic acid is given. In high-risk cases, the chemotherapy has to be done according to a specific scheme called the EMACO scheme. It consists of five different medications, which are etoposid, methotrexate, actinomycin, cyclophosphamide, and vincristin. After the therapy, the HCG levels have to be checked weekly. If two consecutive measurements have been negative, the HCG levels can be checked monthly. The control window is usually six months. If the HCG level remained elevated, another curatage has to be considered, as this might indicate the tissue has been remaining inside the uterine cavity. In some cases, the molar pregnancy can develop into a chorion epithelioma or choriocarcinoma. This risk is approximately 15% in complete molar pregnancies and around 5% in incomplete molar pregnancies. A choriocarcinoma, a chorion epithelioma, is a highly aggressive malignant tumor, which consists of trophoblastic tissue. Histologically, it expresses the signs of malignancy. These types of cancer can also develop after a miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, or a normal pregnancy. The tumor formation usually invades and destroys the function and architecture of the myometrium, which bears the risk of hemorrhage. It also usually gives metastasis to mostly the lung, vagina, brain and liver quite early. This type of cancer can be detected by severely increased levels of beta-HCG or pelvic ultrasound showing masses, a varying appearance which may indicate hemorrhages, necrosis and cysts. If this type of cancer is suspected, 
A histopathologic examination is necessary. It usually shows you to trophoblastic and syncytial trophoblastics without chorionic villi. Treatment includes chemotherapy with methotrexate or dictinomycin and a surgical removal of the cancerous lesion is necessary. In some cases, a hysterectomy is also necessary. After the treatment, the beta HCG levels have to be monitored for at least one year. If the cancer is detected early, it has a cure rate of 95 to 100 percent. However, the prognosis is significantly worse if it is detected at a later stage. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching. If you like our channel, please subscribe. Thank you very much.